Hello besties and welcome to another Genshin Theory! A few days ago we got a new Archon quest about Conria. I always get so anxious when these comes out. I know they're gonna have game-changing lore and it's always fun to see what happens in these quests specifically. And this quest has a lot to unpack even though it was relatively short. Obviously this video contains spoilers for the new 3.5 Archon quest, so you've been warned. This quest begins with the conversation between the Traveler, Paimon, Kaya, and Dainsleaf at a tavern in Port Ormos. Here we learn that Kaya is a descendant of the Abyss Order's founder and that he's not a full-blooded Conrian. Apparently, you can tell how Conrian someone's heritage is by looking at their eyes. The more prominent the stars in their pupils are, the more Conrian they are. Dainsleaf, for example, is a full-blooded Conrian. Kaya's heritage will come up again later, so keep that in mind. Kaya leaves when the conversation gets a little too heavy for him. Whether he genuinely didn't want to discuss a serious topic or if he was hiding something is unclear. Personally, I think he was actually uncomfortable talking about this stuff as he was pretty forthcoming about everything else in the conversation. Kaya, you're not involved with the Abyss Order in any way, are you? Hey, hold on now. This conversation has taken a rather sudden turn for the deadly serious. And I'm afraid that as someone from Mondstadt, I'm not accustomed to this sort of atmosphere. So what if I know my ancestry? Do I strike you as the type who would be bound by that kind of thing? Regardless, the Traveler, Paimon, and Dainsleaf leave Port Ormos and go to Avidia Forest to investigate the Abyss Order's Loom of Fate plan. In case you don't remember, the Loom of Fate is an operation run by the Abyss Order wherein they are attempting to create their own deity. The first time we heard about this plan was in We Will Be Reunited, where we saw the defiled statue of Barbados turned upside down and corrupted with abyssal power. The statue seems to have lethal properties. The Grand Thief of the Treasure Hoarders died in front of the statue for unknown reasons. In Avidia Forest, we find a seemingly abandoned house containing medicinal herbs, a bed, and a broken and mirror. Dainsleaf leaves us and ventures into the forest. As night falls, Paimon volunteers to watch over the Traveler while they sleep, but when they wake up, Paimon is gone. They enter the house in hopes that she's there, but they run into Aid, a defensive man urging them not to go inside. Aid later agrees to allow the Traveler to enter the house, where they find a Hillichur lying on the bed. Aid then explains his backstory. He was a Conrian noble pre-Cataclysm, and this Hillichur is his son, Kari Bear. When the Cataclysm happened, full-blooded Conrians received a curse of immortality, and half-blooded Conrians were turned into monsters. Kari Bear was born to Aid, a Conrian, and his unnamed mother who came from Mondstadt. We don't know what happened to her. Aid says that he was separated from her, likely during the Cataclysm. If this is the case, she has to be dead. Even if she didn't die during the Cataclysm, which I doubt, she would have died of old age a long time ago. Aid wants to help Kari Bear regain his consciousness, even though he will never have his old human body back. The Traveler helps him create a remedy that Aid learned about in a banned book from Conria's royal library. This book is from Sumeru, and the final step of creating the medicine is to pray to the Dendro Archon at a Statue of the Seven. Unsurprisingly, Aid is uncomfortable with this, but does so anyway in hopes of curing his son. It doesn't work the first time. When they head back to the Statue of the Seven to try again, they see a Hillichol running into the cave on the border between Sumeru and Liyue. Thinking that it may be Kari Bear, they follow it. They enter a portal at the end of the cave after finding that the Hillichol is not Kari Bear. They're transported to ruins, as is expected of Genshin. Hillichurls are walking through the ruins and stopping at random times to bow to something unknown. Towards the end, what appears to be a cryo abyss lector approaches us and tells us that fate has not granted us the right to enter this place, but that he will grant us a trial of destiny. We fight the abyss lector, which is named Fortune Lector, as he's apparently not from the Abyss Order. For some reason, Aid is enamored with him, he calls him a perfect being. Upon defeating the Fortune Lector, we discover another defiled statue, only this time it looks even more corrupted than the one we saw and we will be reunited. It's so consumed by abyssal energy that the god on the statue is unidentifiable. The Hillichurl stop here and worship the statue. Wordlessly, Aid does the same. The statue seems to have a voice. It speaks to us in our minds, so no one can hear what he has to say but us. He tells us that he's a sinner, then tries to convince us to transcend our fate, likely by siding with him. When the Traveler and Aid leave the ruins, they go to give the second dose of medicine to Kari Bear back at the house. This time it works. Kari Bear speaks to his father, obviously upset to learn that he has been turned into a monster, that his mother is gone, and that his home has been destroyed. Aid instructs Kari Bear to never take off his mask. We leave him alone at the house to investigate the ruins again. There we find that the statue is gone, as are the hilly churls. Upon returning to the house, we find that Kari Bear is missing. Aid sees the mirror, exclaiming that it's broken, even though it was always broken in our eyes. He concludes that Kari Bear must have taken off his mask and seen his now deformed face. A forest ranger tells a panicked aide that he saw a lone hillichurl wandering around and decided to leave it be. Then, at a nearby cliff, we see Kari Bear holding his mask over his face, clearly upset by what he's just seen. He says he can't take it anymore, takes off his mask, and is enveloped in abyssal power. The traveler passes out before we can see what happened to him. Papa! 
Corey Bear. Papa, I can't take it. Please, Corey Bear. It's my fault. I'm so sorry. If only I'd known. It's all... It's all too much. Papa! <sighs> When the Traveler wakes up, Aid tells us that his real name is Clothar Alberic and that Kari Bear did not deserve his fate. He then refers to the Traveler as their sibling, and we realize that this entire ordeal has been a flashback of the Abyss Twins' memories. Finally, we wake up in reality again with Paimon and Dainsleaf. The Traveler and Dainsleaf decide to dig up whatever was buried in the field outside the house. There they find a male and female skeleton. The male skeleton was buried later than the female skeleton, and it's holding the scarf that Kari Bear once wore on his arm. It was his mother's. They quickly rebury the skeletons, and just as mysteriously as he appeared, Dainsleaf leaves once again. That was a longer summary than I had planned, but I felt like I needed to cover all the important stuff, which is a lot. I have two theories based on the events of this quest, one about the defiled statue and one about the skeleton, so let's start with the statue. Since the events of this quest are a flashback from the perspective of our sibling, we can assume that this happened a long time ago. I think this had to have happened soon after the Cataclysm, at least within a hundred years of the disaster. This quest shows us how our sibling came to support the Abyss Order, and that had to have happened rather quickly after the Cataclysm given their track record. Also, the second defiled statue, the one from We Will Be Reunited, was stolen a hundred years ago. This new statue in this quest is likely not the same one that we saw in We Will Be Reunited, so I think that this happened around 400 to 500 years ago. Because these two defiled statues are not the same, it's important to identify which god is on the statue in this new quest. For clarity, I'll be calling the defiled statue from We Will Be Reunited the Defiled Statue, and I'll be calling the one from Kari Bear, the new quest, the Statue of the Sinner. The defiled statue was stolen from Mondstadt a hundred years ago, likely from Cape Oath, judging by the empty stone circle on the cliff there. The Abyss Order tends to single out Barbados when they air their grievances about the Seven. For example, Dainsleaf tells us that we should not trust them when we're outside of the Favonius Cathedral. I and lots of other Genshin theorists believe that this is because Venti committed some sort of unforgivable atrocity against Conrians during the Cataclysm while the other Archons did not. What that atrocity was is unknown, but it's clear that the Abyss Order really has something against him specifically. I'd also like to point out that in We Will Be Reunited, the Defiled Statue was stolen from Mondstadt but stored in Liyue, nowhere near the border. It would have been much more convenient for the Abyss Order to have taken and corrupted a statue of Morax, but they went out of their way to get one of Barbados. There has to be a reason for that. Unlike the Defiled Statue, the Statue of the Sinner is unrecognizable as any god. As far as we know, there aren't any records of any other statues being stolen from Mondstadt, so I find it highly unlikely that this one is also a statue of Barbados. Liyue, Inazuma, and Sumeru don't have any evidence that would make me think a statue was ever stolen there, so I think that this statue had to have been taken from a country we haven't visited yet. Those three are Natlan, Fontaine, and Snezhnaya. Snezhnaya's Archon, the Tsaritsa, is undoubtedly one of the most important characters in Genshin. She's the founder of the Fatui, the largest and most influential organization in Tevat, and the Archon quests have been building her up to be a main antagonist. The Tsaritsa is implied to have been the kindest of the Archons before the Cataclysm, but she was so traumatized by what she did and witnessed in Conria that she became the cold-hearted dictator she is today. It's also implied that she is, or was, the god of love, so naturally she would be a generally caring person. Piero, the director of the Fatui and the first ever member, is Conrian. He attempted to stop Conria's ruling Eclipse Dynasty from, quote, tearing away the veil of sin, but failed. The Tsaritsa and Piero have an interesting dynamic. They're diametrically opposed, one being an Archon and the other being Conrian, but they seem to trust each other more than anybody else. With this in mind, I think that the statue of the sinner may be of the Tsaritsa, taken from Snezhnaya. The defiled statue, the second attempt at the Loom of Fate operation, is of the god who likely hurt Conria the most. I think it would be fitting if the statue of the sinner was the exact opposite. By taking in Piero and putting him in a position of great power, the Tsaritsa has proven to Conrians that she is to be trusted even though she's a god. Surviving Conrians may have seen this and assumed that using her statue to create their own god would yield positive results as she has done something good for them. Remember the Fortune Lector? It looked and acted like a Cryo Abyss Lector. It's also worth mentioning that the Fortune Lector has the same voice as the sinner, just with a different filter on it. Halt, humans! Fate has not granted you the right to enter this place. 
<sighs> Do you insist on an audience? Oh, dear creature, why do you bow down? For fear of the unknown? Or for a power that you covet? This could have been done to save budget on voice actors, or it could be because the fortune lector is a physical manifestation of the sinner outside of the statue. If that's the case, then of course it would wield cryo. The statue that the sinner lives within is that of the cryo archon. Of course, there's no way to actually tell if this is true or not. The statue of the sinner could really be anybody you want it to be, but I think it makes the most sense for it to be the Saritza. As for the second theory I have based on this quest, remember the skeletons that the Traveler and Dainsleaf dug up at the end? I've seen so many people ask the same few questions about them. Who are they and who buried them? There's a male and a female skeleton buried in the field. The female skeleton was buried before the male skeleton, and the male one is holding Kari Bear's scarf. First of all, the female skeleton has to be Kari Bear's mother. There's nobody else that would make sense. Clothar says that he was separated from her, but he doesn't elaborate any further. Given how emotional he is about the Cataclysm and his family, it would make sense for him to be withholding information about it, as he may not be comfortable talking about it yet. On the way out of Conria, as disaster descended, Clothar may have found her dead body. Obviously, this guy loves his family, so I don't think it's crazy to say that he may have brought her out of Conria to bury her outside of his new home in Sumeru, that way she would always be nearby. That would explain why the female skeleton was buried first. Since we don't know the fates of Clothar and Kari Bear, the male skeleton could be either one of them. I feel like I usually see people say that the male skeleton is Clothar, but I'm not so sure. Clothar was cursed to live forever. He can't die that easily. The Traveler and Dainsleaf mention this and say that maybe he found a way to overcome the curse. However, I find this highly unlikely. Instead, I think Kari Bear died when we last saw him on the cliff. He was covered in abyssal power as he removed his mask one more time. I think that he died in that moment right after the Traveler passed out. Kari Bear literally said that he can't take it anymore, which makes me think that he deliberately took off his mask again, this time knowing that it would kill him. I think Kari Bear was so heartbroken over what had happened to him that he killed himself. Unlike full-blooded Conrians who received the Curse of Immortality, Hilichurls are able to die. It makes much more sense for Kari Bear to have killed himself than for Clothar to have undone his curse. The male skeleton was holding the scarf that Kari Bear wore on his arm. You could argue that the skeleton would be wearing the scarf if it was Kari Bear, but it fell off when he was running to the cliff. It's his scarf. He dropped it. it uh, looks like we're going the right way. Uh, come on. I think that after Kari Bear killed himself, Clothar placed the scarf in his deceased son's hands before burying him next to his mother. With Kari Bear dead, Clothar had no reason to stay in Avidia Forest. Clothar comes from the Alberic family. Dainsleaf tells us that this family founded the Abyss Order. I think that after his son passed away, Clothar officially created the Abyss Order, even though a group of surviving Conrians likely already existed operating under the same values thanks to the existence of the Statue of the Sinner. Upon seeing the Statue of the Sinner and having what I can only describe as a religious epiphany, Clothar began the Loom of Fate operation, which would later result in the defiled statue. Since Kaya is a descendant of the Abyss Order's founder, he must be related to Clothar in some way. Thanks to some wonderful research done in my Discord server, we found that Clothar and Kari Bear are actually named after historical figures from the Frankish Merovingian dynasty Clothar I and Kari Bear I. Clothar I had multiple children with a few different women, one of these obviously being Kari Bear I. Because of this, I think that Clothar may have had another child after Kari Bear killed himself. This child would have been Kari Bear's half sibling. To me, this seems like the only way that the Alberic bloodline would have continued long enough to get where it is now with Kaya. Because he was in Sumeru at the time, Clothar may have had a child with a woman from there and not another full blooded Conrian. That would explain why Kaya's star pupils are not as prominent as Dainsleaf's. Since then, it's impossible to know what happened to Clothar. I doubt he ever undid the curse and died. For all we know, he could still be in charge of the Abyss Order to this day. Dainsleaf implied that our sibling, the Abyss Twin, is not at the top of the Abyss Order's hierarchy as their title is just Prince or Princess. Instead, the leader would be the king, in this case, Clothar. I know some of the stuff I said is kind of out there, but personally, I think I did a good job. I think it makes sense. Let me know your thoughts on this quest, though. There was so much that happened, so I'm sure you all have great theories on what you think is going on here. I really liked this quest. I haven't been loving the Archon quests lately, but getting new Conria lore always gets me interested again. Earlier, I mentioned that I got some of the info for this video in my Discord server, so you should definitely join in if you want to see what goes on in there. The link is in the pinned comment, as always. Thank you so much for liking, commenting, and subscribing, and I'll see you next time. Bye, besties!